Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak at this wonderful conference. And thanks to everyone for making possible uh, you know, this conference in these very difficult circumstances. So I would like to share with you some ideas uh, I have been thinking about over the past several years. And in particular, a summary of those ideas are in this last paper, which is titled The Vector Hypothesis. So let's begin with the black hole information paradox. So here I have a shell which collapses classically, all the stuff goes to the center, and then we produce these entangled pairs at the horizon, which you can schematically model as 0, 0, plus 1, 1, and there will always be small corrections of order epsilon coming from some quantum gravity effects. But in this picture, the entanglement of the radiation with the black hole that stays behind, well, that just keeps monotonically growing with time, while for a normal body, that entanglement should go to zero, and that gives us the uh, information puzzle. Now, with the first ball paradigm for understanding black holes, uh, we don't face this problem. So what is the first ball paradigm? You consider brains in string theory and make their bound states because that's how you should think of black holes in the theory. And weak coupling, these brains might simply make some bound state whose size might be Planck length or string length. But then what happens when you increase the coupling to the point where you expect a black hole? Now, at first, you might think that the brain bound state remains Planck size and a huge empty space develops around it with a horizon. And in that case, you would get a traditional picture of the black hole and you would still have the information puzzle. But what was found was that that's not what happens. The size of the brain bound state actually grows with the coupling and the number of brains in the state so that the size of the bound state is always order the horizon size. So a traditional horizon actually never forms. And so, in fact, what you end up getting is just an object which conceptually is no different from a piece of coal or a planet. It just radiates information from its surface like any other body and there is no information puzzle. So in fact, in one sense, if you just accept that what we have been seeing from string theory is the answer, and now there's so much evidence that in fact it is, then the information puzzle is solved. Black holes are just like pieces of coal. But what we'll see in this talk is that we will learn a lot by asking a slightly more refined question. Where and when does the semi-classical approximation break down? So again, consider the shell which was collapsing. Uh, when it passes through its horizon radius given by these dotted lines, uh, all curvatures are low. And then when it goes all the way near the center, in the region between the shell and the horizon, the light cones actually turn inwards. We are actually going to assume there are no large violations of causality in our gravity theory. Okay? But in that case, what is happening in the semi-classical picture at the center, uh, it cannot actually influence what is happening at the horizon because those two places are uh, very far apart uh, causally. So in that case, how does the semi-classical picture change in such a way that somehow at the end, instead of just getting this normal horizon with normal physics at the horizon, we end up with the first ball. So this, of course, is the central aspect of the information question. As you do the semi-classical collapse, all curvatures are low. When you get to the singularity, you can ask for new physics, but then you cannot causally actually influence the horizon anymore. So you'll keep getting the entangled pairs and you are in trouble. So in fact, this is the central puzzle. And this is the question we will try to give an answer to in this talk. Of course, this question is qualitative. And so our discussion today will also be completely qualitative. It will be a discussion of a picture, but that picture will resolve this basic puzzle. So we will argue for a picture of the quantum gravity vacuum, which will resolve the puzzle. We call this picture the vector hypothesis, and its acronym is given here. We will see the meaning of these terms as we go through the talk. But the rough idea is as follows. We have seen that the microstates of the black hole are these extended objects, this E extended stands for the E in the uh, vector acronym. And so the extended objects are size a little bit uh, larger than Planck, uh, larger than the horizon radius. But if these are the real objects in the theory, then the quantum gravity vacuum, the state with zero energy, must contain virtual fluctuations corresponding to these objects. So here I have depicted the fact that around every point of space and time, there will be these virtual fluctuations of these first ball type configurations of all sizes around every point at every time. Now, you might think that the fluctuations of an object with size much larger than Planck length will be highly suppressed. And of course, you will be right. But the point is that if you look at on-shell first balls, there are an exponential s Bekenstein number of such objects, which for large r is a very large number. So in fact, there will be a large 
phase space of such configurations. And we will assume that this large phase space will offset the suppression so that overall these virtual fluctuations will remain an important component of our vacuum. So in fact, we'll have one more property of these vectors, the compression resistance, but we will come to that later on. But then this is the vector hypothesis. The quantum gravity vacuum contains an important component consisting of virtual fuzzball type configurations. And that this component plays a crucial role in situations where a horizon is predicted by a semi-classical theory. And so just when a horizon would, would have formed, what happens is that these virtual fluctuations, they turn to on-shell configurations and they resolve the puzzles that arise. So in this talk, we'll be talking about the puzzle that come from how, what happens during gravitational collapse. But other puzzles which are addressed in that paper I mentioned is that it also resolves the bags of gold problem. It tells, answers the question, are the Rindler black hole and cosmological horizon similar? They look similar at the classical level, but in fact, they are not. They differ in their vector fluctuation. And in fact, we'll see that uh, it can also impact cosmological issues like inflation, cosmological constant. And if I get a chance at the end of the talk, I'll talk about how it could change the picture of bubble nucleation. Okay, so let me begin with a brief review of fuzzballs. Lots of people have worked and contributed to the fuzzball game. I've listed some of their names over here. But again, uh, just starting with the very basics, it goes back to this observation that if you try to estimate the size of a bound state of let's say D1, D5, and P charges, then the, the size depends on the number of brains and the string coupling. Uh, these are uh, parameters appearing in the, in the compactification. And the size which you estimate for this bound state is a complicated function of these variables. But in fact, remarkably, this complicated function you get is of the same order as the horizon radius of a black hole with those charges and that mass. So in that case, that's what suggested that, in fact, you never actually end up getting a black hole in string theory. A black hole just doesn't form. And since then, many, many examples of explicit string solutions have been constructed for these bound states. And in each case, we have found that there is actually no horizon. You always get a, get a fuzzball instead. And so the fuzzball conjecture just says that no microstate in string theory will have a traditional horizon, which is defined as something which has the vacuum in its vicinity, where you get pair production up to order epsilon corrections of the kind that Hawking was envisaging. Uh, in fact, you just get a normal body with the surface and the Radiation then depends on what you have on the surface. You might at this point ask, how did we bypass the various low hair theorems for classical gravity? And in fact, there are special features of string theory with extra dimensions, extended objects, Chern-Simmons terms, etc., which in each case allow you to bypass these uh, theorems. We could still ask, though, what about the spirit of something like Buchdel's theorem? If you take a fluid sphere where the pressure is decreasing outwards and the radius is greater than two and is less than two and a quarter m. Well, then you put the pressure to zero at the surface of that sphere. And if you integrate the pressure balance equation inwards, you find that the pressure will diverge someplace before you reach r equal to zero. You will then say it's not a good solution and must therefore collapse to make a black hole. Well, let's just look at a toy model, which will help us understand a little bit of how all these extra features of a theory like string theory can help us evade these puzzles. Take a geometry which is Euclidean Schwarzschild plus time. So it's a, a geometry in four plus one dimensions. These four dimensions make Euclidean Schwarzschild, which has geometry for cigar with a compact circle labeled by this coordinate tau. Tau has this periodicity over here. And then uh, the, uh, I just tacked on an extra Minkowski time. This entire geometry is a solution of the vacuum Einstein equations in four plus one dimensions. But let us dimensionally reduce on the direction tau uh, to get a three plus one gravity uh, theory coupled to a scalar field which comes from the size of the tau circle. That scalar field has the normal stress tensor of a minimally coupled scalar. And from the point of view of the three plus one theory, you could now ask, uh, why is this uh, shell of scalar field not collapsing inwards? Why is it staying where it is? In fact, if you work out the stress tensor of the scalar field, you find that its components diverge as you get to the tip of the cigar. So this is actually singular from uh, a perspective of somebody who was trying to do a book that type analysis and you would discard this solution. But in fact, the solution is completely regular in four plus one dimensions. It's only th from the three plus one dimensional perspective and the compactification that the decomposition broke down. And so in fact, the overall solution is completely regular and just stays in there, even though the pressure seems to be uh, becoming sick in some fashion. So we can keep this at the back of our mind as a toy model of the fuzzball for what, what's going to follow. In general, fuzzballs are made with uh, lots of extra things like strings, brains, fluxes, and so on. 
but for present purposes, you can just imagine we have these little things, each of these little things I've drawn here, you can think of as one bubble of Euclidean Schwarzschild, and these bubbles are fitted together in a way that they hold themselves together to make some kind of a bound state, and I'm not saying puzzles are really have to be anything like this in, in any particular detail, but is there just a good toy picture to keep in your mind for the purposes of what we are going to discuss qualitatively in this talk. Let's then get back to our causality puzzle. So here was the puzzle. Let's take a shell which is made, let's say, of massless gravitons. So it's collapsing at the speed of light. You can just, that gives us the stiffest contradictions. And then at some point it will pass through its horizon, at which point the curvatures are still low. So it seems there's nothing which can stop that. And then it, once it goes inside, even though new physics can happen because the light cones point inwards, how does it actually up, up influence what happens at the horizon? We will in fact assume causality because as far as I know, string theory does not manifest any large violations of causality. So if curvatures are low throughout a space-time region, then we will assume causality holds to leading order. You can always have small corrections from any quantum gravity effects anywhere. And causality means the signals do not propagate outside the light cone and there are no non-local interactions between points that are space-like separated. Again, there can be small effects, but not large enough to suddenly change my horizon completely. Well, in that case, how do we actually go from a picture which was giving us this to actually making a fuzz ball? In fact, you can make the puzzle even more precise by looking at what I, I call partial shells. So this was again my shell which was collapsing and this was the horizon radius. Let's consider two situations. One where we allow the shell to just go through its horizon and then we do expect in the classical theory or in, in fact in the full theory for a black hole to form. But then the other thing we could do is when all the shell reaches the radius, let's say like 4m, we just stop all the other parts of the shell, but one little piece we allow it to go in. And in this case, you actually don't expect the black hole to form because a little piece of the shell is almost like a planar axle, Eichelberg's axle wave. And when Eichelberg's axle wave passes through any point of space, then that point of space just has local quantum gravity fluctuation, of course. And when the wave passes through, it may mess them up a little bit. But once the wave is gone, the space-time returns back to the vacuum. So in fact, nothing actually happens. There's no memory of that left once you pass it there. And so if you could actually look locally at each of these pieces, uh, uh, even in this case, you would see that nothing should happen and the thing should just semi-classically go to the center. So then you just get tracked by the, by the causality puzzle. But now you can begin to see why we are thinking in terms of vector fluctuations as the things which will come and solve our puzzle because these fluctuations have an extended size and in fact they can therefore feel around the scale of the horizon that we are going to uh, create and so they can know whether the entire shell is coming or only a part of the shell is coming and so in fact what we are going to argue is that these virtual fluctuations of large size uh, which are not suppressed because there are so many of them the phase space factor overwhelms their action for suppression these, these vector fluctuations are the ones that will actually become, will uh, see that the entire shell is about to uh, make a black hole and they will actually become on shell instead of virtual fluctuations at the point where the black hole really forms. So that was a qualitative picture of where we are going. And so now let's take a slightly more detailed look at the uh, vector hypothesis. So again, for that, let's now, we've been saying very roughly things like virtual fluctuations, but what really is a virtual fluctuation? So if you just take a free scalar field, for example, then you can look at each Fourier mode phi k, I've plotted its amplitude on the x-axis and the potential of that on the y-axis. And that's just a harmonic oscillator potential. And because I'm in the vacuum state, I just get the vacuum Gaussian as the wave function. Well then, uh, the wave function has a tail which is going into regions where phi square is negative. And that's what we just call the virtual fluctuation. Uh, you don't actually have an on shell oscillating wave function there, but you do have this tail where the pi square is negative. And you can call that the virtual fluctuations of scalar field particles in the vacuum of this scalar field theory. Now suppose the scalar field actually arose at the size of a compact circle. Then this is the compact circle that I have drawn here. And then when the so, so, uh, circle size fluctuates a little bit up or down, well, those are exactly this tail out here. But in fact, you can also have large fluctuations where the circle pinches off and you make a new topology where you create a hole in the middle and the rest of it closes off like a cigar. That's a bit like the model we had for the Euclidean Schwarzschild, which was our toy model for the fuzz ball. So in fact, there is a part of this tail which goes into the region, which is not captured by the scalar field. It's actually into the region where we have these uh, new topologies which give rise to fuzz ball type configurations. And so again, as we had said, a bound states of these kinds of uh, local Euclid Schwarzschild was our toy model for the moment of what the fuzzball was doing. So let's continue with that picture for a moment. 
So then let's ask how do bound states show up in the potential we were just sketching. So you could have uh, virtual fluctuations of the fundamental field, let's say electrons and positrons, but then you also expect that bound states like the positronium or even a benzene ring uh, would show up as fluctuations in the vacuum. Now an on-shell positronium state is orthogonal to the vacuum, so what do we really mean by saying there are fluctuations of the positronium in the vacuum? Well, what really happens is that the way a bound state manifests itself in these potential diagrams we have been drawing is that if we draw the configuration space of all configurations in the theory on the horizontal axis and the potential for that configuration on the vertical axis, if I just had E plus E minus in the theory, I would have a potential, let's say, like this purple curve. But if there are bound states like the positronium, then in those directions of field space where the bound states form, we simply get a lowering of the potential. And so here, the potential gets lowered, correspond to the bound states in the theory and then the vacuum wave functional actually spreads a little bit more because the potential is lower and this wider spread of the vacuum wave functional is how we see the uh, existence of virtual fluctuations of these bound states uh, in the vacuum. Well then we come to the question we had noted before which was very important, the fluctuation to any one large fuzzball configuration will be highly suppressed. You can write it as the probability as something like exponential of minus an action and the action you could write as energy times time and if I put the energy to be the mass of a black hole in these space dimensions, and the time also being just like the crossing time, then in fact, the suppression you can see is rather large when R is much bigger than LP. But then, as we said, there are a large number of fuzz balls. If I write that number as e to the s Bekenstein, then you find that the exponent you get over here is such that this p times this n, the p is small and the n is big, but at least for on-shell fuzz balls, this two can cancel and give you something of order unity. So the suppression is indeed, in this case, offset by the large degeneracy. Now, of course, we are going to talk about virtual fluctuations, and we understand much less about that. This was for uh, on-shell fuzz balls. And so we'll just make as part of our hypothesis that the part of the wave functional which leaks in these vector directions is actually going to be significant even when we come to large vectors because of this offset between the large phase space and the suppression. The last point we were going to talk about was the compression resistance. So the first ball configurations are such that they are rather resistant to compression. If you squeeze them or stretch them, uh, it costs you energy. You can see that by looking at actual vector configurations which have been, uh, first ball configurations which have been made, but you can also argue more abstractly by looking at the equation of state for the black hole gas, which would now be a gas of first ball. So at least for on-shell first balls, one can argue that the equation of state P equals rho is what you get, and that's the stiffest one allowed by causality. So anyway, we'll just assume that whatever we have learned from on-shell first balls also applies to the, the configuration which show up in the, their virtual fluctuations. And the scale we learn for the compression energy in that case, is that if you take a vector of radius Rv and you compress it uh, to a radius one minus delta times Rv, and let delta be order one, suppose you compress it to half its size, then the amount of energy increase you get is of order the mass of a black hole with radius of the order of you can make a heuristic model to uh, sort of model that, but that won't be important to us. Uh, I'm just saying that the compressibility is what I just said in words over here. So anyway, with all this, we have arrived at a qualitative picture for the behavior of these vector fluctuations. There are these virtual fluctuations around every point. They're extended. They are very numerous. So this is an important component of the vacuum under the hypothesis, and they are compression resistant. We have some picture of what these virtual fluctuations should behave like. Let's now see how it comes back and solves a puzzle. So if you just first take just a vector in flat space, that's over here, and then you put some ordinary object like a star in the middle over there, but the star has a gravitational pull, so it slightly pulls the vector in, the vector gets compressed, but of course it's compression resistance, resistant, so after compressing a little bit, uh, it stabilizes, and so I've drawn this gray thing a little bit smaller than this, but that's all that happens. And this uh, part of the dynamics is of course just included in the dynamics you get from the uh, Einstein action, because after all this was, this vacuum was part of, these vectors are part of the vacuum wave functional, so whatever they did was part of the effective action you were seeing in gravity anyway. But now let's look at the situation with gravitational collapse. I have a dust ball which is now collapsing. Once it goes inside the horizon, the light cones turn inwards, and finally now this ball can't stop, and so the whole thing goes to a singularity. That was the traditional picture of black hole collapse. But now we have to ask, what are the vector fluctuations doing? Now inside the horizon, as we said, the light cones point inwards. So any vector fluctuation that you have over here, it also cannot be a stable configuration which just stays where it is. It must keep compressing just by the structure of light cones. It cannot stabilize. Now, if it keeps on compressing, uh, then an order unity compression of the vector actually distorts the wave functional completely. 
and it distorts it to the point where the vector actually turns into an on-shell first box. So in fact, we'll see that because in this case, the uh, compression must keep going on and on. The vacuum doesn't just change a little bit and stabilize in its wave functional. The wave functional has to change by a large amount. And that's what I've drawn in this picture over here. You have uh, the vectors which are inside the horizon. They're forced to keep on compressing. And so that's what's special about when you make a horizon. Once you make a closed trap surface, these vectors have to keep on compressing. And then at some point, they start turning into on-shell fuzz balls. That's depicted by these uh, dark rings over here. And then over a, a time of order of few crossing times, you actually end up with an on-shell fuzz. So in terms of the potential graphs we were drawing, uh, this was the wave function we had. The steps of higher and higher uh, energy were in fact uh, the vectors of higher and higher, uh, larger and larger size. But now what is happening is the vectors which were uh, larger, the ones which were uh, of the order of the horizon size, uh, under the attraction of the star, the very intense attraction you get near the horizon, their energy rose very steeply. So the part of the wave function which was leaking over there, well, that must actually squeeze inwards. And in squeezing inwards, it actually becomes oscillatory in part of the region where you actually had a vector configuration. So in fact, that's uh, literally what we meant by these pictures, that the wave function actually turned from being uh, just in a region where phi square was uh, less than zero, a part of the wave function on the, over the vector configurations, that now has phi square greater than zero, which just means you formed on-shell fuzz balls. And that is our picture for how the puzzle is actually resolved, uh, the causality puzzle is resolved, and you actually end up making the on-shell fuzz balls. So as an illustrative model of what just happened, you could look at something as simple as the Schwinger effect. So uh, take the two plates, uh, one positive and one negative, and let there be a very large number n of flavors of the charged particles. So you know the vacuum gets polarized, but if I choose the separation between the plates to be less than a certain critical value, I cannot actually create on-shell particles of E plus E minus. So the vacuum is highly polarized, but there are no on-shell particles. But if I increase the separation of the plates now to be larger than this critical value, then I will indeed get a cascade of on-shell particles, uh, which will just, uh, there'll be a very large number of them because I've taken a large number of flavors. Now, suppose somebody had not realized that the vacuum had this very high polarization from these large number of uh, flavors of charged particles. This large number n is like the large degeneracy of possible vectors that we can have. Suppose nobody thought much about the vacuum polarization, then when he actually crossed the critical distance and suddenly found a whole cascade of on-shell particles coming, he would be surprised what happened here. But then if he had always been aware of the fact that these positions were there, then in fact, all that happens at the critical transition is that things which were getting close to being on-shell now actually just turn on-shell. And that's essentially what we are saying also happens with the vector fluctuations. The vacuum actually has a large number of these virtual fluctuations. They are all just part of the vacuum wave function, but they cascade to on-shell first balls. Once these uh, vector fluctuations suffer an unbounded compression, uh, which comes when they're inside a closed trap surface. So that is our picture. Let's just take a couple of minutes to say how this might uh, influence things that we see in cosmology. So it's completely speculative, but just to tell you how it could be of interest. We said a black hole has a closed trap surface uh, uh, and that's why vectors inside there just cannot be stable. They have to keep compressing and then they, these structures just get destroyed. Now cosmology is just the opposite. Under T to minus T it's the same, but uh, because we have an expanding cosmology, we have anti-trap surfaces. And now you can see if we have a vector which is bigger than the size of the cosmological horizon, then it is actually going to be torn apart. So in fact, if you, there just can't be any vectors this time, which are larger than the horizon, just like here, you couldn't have vectors which were smaller than the horizon. So in fact, an important ingredient to think about uh, in cosmology as well is now in any space time, an important thing to think about is what's the number density of vectors uh, uh, as plotted with the vector size RV. So in Minkowski space, we said we have vectors of all sizes, but in the cosmology, the vector size actually has to trail off and end at order H inverse. So let's see what this might do in a situation of bubble nucleation. So suppose I have a scalar field with a potential which has one metastable minimum, and at that I would kind of, if the field is here, I get a DC to space, and that's drawn out here in blue. But if the field tunnels down to this zero energy configuration, then I will get a bubble of flat space time with some radius r, and then this bubble expands. This thing in black here is the bubble wall, and as r goes to infinity, the speed, speed of the bubble wall goes to infinity. It goes to, goes to the speed of light. So why does it go to the speed of light? Because the energy we get from the potential drop from here to here is proportional to the volume. 
and uh, the energy which is in the bubble wall is only proportional to the area. So as R becomes big, uh, the extra factor of R here is made up by the fact that gamma, the boost factor, goes to infinity, which means V has to go to 1. But now we should actually ask, what are the vector of fluctuations doing? In the DC phase here, the vector fluctuations were limited in size by H inverse, while flat space needs vectors of all sizes. So in particular, uh, if the flat space region has size R, we need vectors all the way up to R. But to make a vector of radius r needs at least a light crossing time across that distance. For example, if you want to make a benzene ring fluctuation, you must at least have time to go across the diameter of a benzene ring. But that tells you that the flat space region can only expand at a speed which is less or equal to half the speed of light, which means gamma must remain of order one. But then we actually cannot get this energy balance where all the energy went to the bubble wall. And in fact, the picture must change saying that the energy which is, uh, we had, uh, which we got from transitioning from the blue phase to the white phase, uh, must actually remain distributed all through inside. We can't just go to flat space immediately inside. We have to slowly uh, trickle down to the flat space and the bubble has to actually expand slowly all the while depositing its energy all through this bubble. Now, I think, I don't know if this is uh, uh, completely going to be the right theory here, but I think it's very interesting because one of the early studies of bubble nucleation, they were actually having this difficulty that the energy all stayed in the bubble wall. Uh, but uh, in fact, if the energy distributed themselves all throughout, it was better for what we see up in the sky. So in fact, if these effects are there, they may be very relevant to cosmology. Okay, so let's Sorry, to... Samir, three minutes. Thank you. Okay, so let me just go to my summary, but I would like to remind people that when we talk about the black hole information paradox, we should always focus on what we have learned from the small corrections theorem. So this inequality actually makes the puzzle precise. And so let's just remind ourselves of what this theorem is. Suppose we make two assumptions. Here's a black hole creating entangled pairs. The pair member B is outside, C is inside. And so leading order Hawking effect, let's say, is modeled by 0, 0, plus 1, 1 entangled. But now we allow small corrections. So in fact, we add a small correction, uh, some epsilon k times the orthogonal state to this basic pair state. The second thing we uh, allow ourselves, so the second thing we assume is that once the radiated quantum gets far out away from the hole, let's say beyond some point 10 m, it doesn't get modified any further. So here we just have normal physics. That's what happens for a piece of burning paper. Once the photon goes out, it's gone. So once you make these two assumptions which look uh, completely uh, innocuous, then this uh, theorem actually proves that the entanglement between the hole and the radiation will keep growing. So Hawking's answer was linearly rising with a small correction that could be slightly less by an amount to epsilon, but in fact cannot turn around and become the page curve. So why was this worth proving? It's worth proving because uh, you can actually make a very complicated state uh, which by using these small corrections. If at the first step, when you mentioned the pair B1, C1, if they were zero, zero, you could correct the second pair B2, C2 by adding some particular uh, correction epsilon one. But if the first pair was emitted with uh, one, one, you could correct the state with a different uh, epsilon, let's call it epsilon one prime. And you can see after n steps of emission, uh, there are two to the n correction terms where you know every thing which was emitted depends on all the previous steps you emitted, but always with small corrections. And then you might think because n is very big, maybe even with small epsilon, the corrections accumulate and somehow could manage to bring your page curve down. But what this theorem does is it tells you, no, you cannot do that. Okay, so I think this is very central because it gives you two very sharp solutions to the information puzzle, which I call the fuzzball paradigm. And for lack of a better word, let me just call it the wormhole paradigm. In the first world paradigm, you do not actually have the vacuum uh, around the horizon. And in fact, you don't have normal pair equation of states. It really burns like a piece of paper and the page curve comes down. There is nothing novel there. And in fact, when you add the vector hypothesis, you solve all the puzzles in a consistent way that we've had with uh, quantum gravity. In the wormhole puzzle, on the other hand, in the wormhole picture, one assumes that here we actually have a state which is close to the state of the vacuum. And we do produce pairs, which at least when you look at a few pairs at a given time, they actually behave like what Hawking had. But in this case, you must do something new. And in fact, we have been seeing very interesting new ideas come up. Uh, some part of the interior of this black hole is not like in the piece of coal. In a piece of the first one is really like a piece of coal inside, outside, everywhere. But here you now have to have new ideas where inside the black hole there's a region which is really part of the radiation outside. That part is not like what we would normally think from the piece of coal. And if you want to have uh, the, a process where the radiation outside can actually pull information out from the inside, then in fact the physics in the region far out, let's say, are of the order of n cube or more 
cannot be the physics we have in a stat med book for particles which have gone out to flat infinity. So I think there are very interesting and ideas here, but I do not believe that they are correct because in fact, we get a complete solution of the puzzle in string theory, but just finding that when you actually make states in the theory, they just look like ordinary pieces of code. They just don't have a horizon and there is nothing further to think about. So what I would like to emphasize by this, uh, this last slide which I have put up here is that sometimes people have this confusion about the information paradox. They would like to say that they would, uh, the full theory might be doing something which is actually going to bring the page curve down. And just these small little corrections that they have uh, can encode the uh, corrections and do uh, what they need. But that is not true. When someone says they have approximately like a black hole in some classical limit, the question you should always ask is, well, do you actually have an entangled pair like this? Are these two equations true? If they say no, then you have to say, well, how did you go to your gravity theory and break the no-hair theorem? You need something like a fuzzball construction, which only works in the full string theory, and you have to go and do that. If they say yes, they do have this kind of pair production up to small corrections of order epsilon, you cannot actually have, uh, if you say, I don't want any non-local physics, you actually cannot get the information out. So I think this is a very important distinction to maintain when people just say the black hole is almost semi-classical, it's almost classical, but I have small effects. The small correction theorem tells you, no, that is not so. You have to be precise. Once you assume this, you will need new physics. Either you'll have remnants and baby universes or you need non-local physics to get the information out, but you can't have the whole thing burning like a piece of paper. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Let's uh, thank Samir for a very nice talk. And now we have eight minutes for questions in order to start the next talk on time. Please raise your hands for questions. Uh, Suvrat. Uh, hi, Samir. I just wanted to uh, clarify an issue about the uh, small corrections theorem. Uh, so yeah. there's a sense, of course, in which, uh, th there's a sense, of course, in which, uh, you know, uh, I think you would agree that one can have small corrections to ordinary correlators and not violate this theorem. But what you're really talking about when you say small corrections is that the full wave function uh, cannot have small corrections uh, from Hawking's computation. Uh, is that correct? And if, if that is correct, I mean, what, what implications does that really have uh, for the question of an experience of an observer uh, who's trying to fall through? Because uh, generally, if you have an observer who's trying to make physical measurements, that observer doesn't try and obtain fine-grained details of the wave function but just of simple observables yeah good yeah thanks for that question i think that really brings us to the uh, the heart of exactly what i was trying to say on this last couple of slides i have always maintained that if you want to address the information puzzle you have to talk about the wave function this is a puzzle about the entire wave functional on a complete cauchy slice and what you get from the semi-classical evolution and why it is not agreeing with what you would like from something like the page curve and the small correction theorem tells you that small corrections to each particular entangled pair near the horizon, uh, if you only allow small corrections, you cannot solve the puzzle without having non-local effects or some new physics, which is far away from the black hole, new physics far from the black hole. So it is indeed a statement in terms of uh, the wave functions. So that's why I think when people talk in terms of operators or endpoint functions or two-point functions, I think they always miss the puzzle. Because if you want to ask something like, okay, what does an infalling observer feel as he's going through, then we have this particular model. You can make a bit model for what I call fuzzball complementarity. If the infalling observer has an energy E much bigger than T, the temperature, then in fact, you can make a bit model. We don't know if the model is true, I actually realized it with fuzzballs, but at least you can make a model where you can effectively reproduce the behavior for order crossing time as if he is falling freely in, even though those are not the actual states of the first ball. It's just that the collective modes of the first ball have the same frequency as the uh, modes uh, seen in empty space, but again, only for modes for E much bigger than T. The important point to always ask for the information puzzle and for the page curve, which we have, for example, up on the screen, is for quanta of energy T, because those are the Hawking quanta. For those you ask about the state, you ask for the state of each pair which is emitted. You don't care what happens once a pair goes far inside, once a member falls far inside, anything can happen to him. It's not important for the theorem. You only want it once the guy is outside, you don't touch it anymore once it's beyond 10. Once you say that that looks like 0, 0 plus 1, 1 plus order epsilon, you need new physics at infinity. Yeah, that is, yeah. the, is the lesson. And I would agree with you that if you just look at infalling observers and things like that, there are many effective behaviors you can have, 
but again, they are for E much bigger than T, and that's not exactly the information question. I call that the info question. Right. I just one one way. Even if you look at observers who are spread out all over the black hole and make low energy two point functions, even they would see the same as the conventional geometry, right? It's only I someone. Think, yeah, that I think is very much possible because I think even if you just take a normal piece of coal, no black hole, no gravity, nothing. And if you just have observers, let's just spread throughout this room, forget cold, just throughout this room, and they're looking at local two-point functions, because every the state in every particular corner of the room is entangled to every other, just one big state, they would not actually be able to figure out if the state of this room is entangled with the state in the next room or not. But that's just a property of any large stat med system. But that's not the information puzzle. In the information puzzle, we assume we have the entire state. And now we are talking about a property of the entire state. We can make any measurements of any precision we want. And we still have a contradiction of the semi-classical picture. But as I was emphasizing, the point is that you shouldn't say the semi-classical picture is almost correct because the almost doesn't work. That's the real power of the information paradox. If you say semi class is correct up to order epsilon, you cannot get out of it. And if you want to make an order one correction, you have to go and see how in your gravity theory, you will beat the no hair theorem. And that is exactly what the puzzle people actually do. But for that, you need the full string theory. And effective theory or just reduced gravity theories will not do that. But thanks for that question. Okay, uh, we'll take the last question from Steve Giddings. Uh, hi, Samir. So I agree with the uh, statement of the small corrections theorem that you need an order one correction to the state. Really, in some sense, that was implicit in the page analysis. But uh, one thing I think that misses is that you can have interactions which are small. Uh, with the quantum state of the black hole that produce an order one change in the state. Uh, when you look at the actual uh, quantum probabilities for interactions, you can have a uh, cancellation between a small interaction or small amplitude and then have that compensated by a large number of final states. So that I think is one way of evading the conclusion that you have to have very, uh, say, well, it, evolution near the horizon that doesn't look normal in your language. Okay. So, uh, so I think what you just said actually is not true. Uh, I think I did read one of your earlier papers. I haven't read your recent paper about it. And I think uh, there was a step where I can point to that something is behaving in a way which is not allowed by unitary analysis. But somehow I don't actually have that in front of me right now. So I'm not able to tell you exactly uh, what I had in mind. But maybe there's something I would really much like to discuss uh, offline. So let me just make a statement I'm making, at least the claim I'm making is, if you actually have a state where the overlap with the vacuum uh, is, sorry, this is not the one I had in mind here. If, the, if you actually have this condition that uh, the overlap of psi with the vacuum is close to one, that is you basically do have the vacuum there up to small corrections, uh, you cannot actually do anything. So uh, if, if that's something that we're not agreeing on, then uh, absolutely let's talk about it offline. Well, I think you can write down model interactions that lead to an order one change in the state, basically, and they're small interactions, but we could continue this later, sure. Sure, we, we can talk about that. Okay, uh, let's uh, thank Samir again. And uh, we're going to move to the next speaker. Our next speaker is Jeff Pennington from Stanford. He's going to talk about replica wormholes and the black hole interior. Okay, very much. Okay, is that working? Can people hear me, see the screen, stuff like that? Great. Yep, okay. Um, awesome, so yeah, thank you very much to the organizers um, for inviting me to give a talk. Uh, so, you know, my talk is called Replica Wormholes in the Black Hole Interior. It's about this paper uh, that came out last November, which was with Steve Schenker, Douglas Stanford, and Jenbin Yang. Uh, and there was a paper that came out the same day by Almiri Hartman, Nardesina Shibulian, and Um And really, a more accurate title for this paper would be Section 2 of Replica Wormholes in the Black Hole Interior, because that's all I'm actually going to talk about. Um, Douglas is going to be talking, about, talking next, and as part of his talk, he might talk a bit about some other aspects of the paper. Um, so, what is the sort of claim of this paper? Um, it's very simple, so that we can successfully calculate the page curve for an evaporating black hole just from a gravitational path interval. 
Um, and a more precise version of this claim in this talk, I'm just going to be talking about a very highly simplified model. It's not really an evaporating black hole at all, um, but it is a black hole with an information paradox. Uh, and you know, the advantage of that model is that we can do very, very precise calculations in it. Uh, you can you know, do the full path integral in that model and so on. Uh, and so we can really calculate anything you might want to calculate. Um, but it really seems to be the case that the, the sort of basic story of how these calculations work is very